uh, it's always seems easier if, if you are at least the same as the people in the country. You know, you can kind of uh, blend in, but sometimes that's not possible. And uh, with these stories, it's just how they just persevere. Um, anybody else? I, I wanted to find the one passage that stuck out to me. Oh, so is anybody in the room Jewish? Do I? Okay. So when she was talking about, and you may not know the answer, but um, how they throw away the the challah, or what do you call it? Challah. Um, is that a real thing that like you? I know that you you present the bread as an offering. You don't show but they show because they in that time you know. We have plenty now, so <laughs> they can put in stale bread. Right, right. right. Usually you don't do this. You, it's not up and all. I'm sure in religion it's created bread. So you but if you go to, you know, and you yeah. go to Israel though, like this woman did, and she sees people were just kind of throwing stuff away, that must drive you mad. And coming from, you know, deprivation. No, like yes, yeah. yeah. And recently my friend who is Jewish too, she from rural region, yeah. mm -hmm. so and uh, here they had to fight in the war from the beginning to the end. It was a tough thing. And so she told me she went to better place, and only toward the clothing around the world. And she saw some bakery. I don't know was continental bakery. They had big box of croissant, croissants that were ready to deliver them. them. I said, and what are you doing? <laughs> and they said, but we cannot keep the more than 24 hours. Give it to me at the table, but we do not. They have to throw them. Take them to the shelter. No, we cannot. They just throw them perfectly good. And she, she said, can you imagine this? That's pacifism right there. Yeah. Um, I do know, um, for instance, I've got a friend who works with a church. And they have a regular schedule where they go to, um, I think it's Starbucks, the local Starbucks, and pick up um, Dale or whatever, and then they take them back to the church or the food bank. Um, but you know, you laugh at these people who do like TikToks or whatever on dumpster diving. They just throw perfectly good merchandise away for no reason. Um, yeah, it didn't sell. And they'll have the workers destroy the stuff before it goes in the dumpster. Mm -hmm. So nobody can use it. It's like, I don't understand that, like clothing and stuff. Mm -hmm. They'll destroy mm -hmm. it so that when it goes in the dumpster, it's, it's really trash now. Mm -hmm. That mentality, I, I don't understand either. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, capitalism drives that too. Um, I don't think there's any perfect system. <laughs> Capitalism, totality, yeah, all of these, these different systems have their bad points. But um, anyway, the I do recommend, I don't know, I sent out an email to some people early. There is a really great discussion with the translator, Ellie Cassidy. Mm -hmm. And it's done by the Ish Book Center, and she goes into detail about Ginta's life and how, um, for instance, she wanted always to be a writer, but was never encouraged because she was a girl. Um, went through all these experiences and didn't start writing anything until she settled in Haifa, Israel in the 70s. Um, and she started hanging out with some of the intelligence she had kind of the writers groups and she got to know you know all the big Jewish writers and she started writing and her daughter at one point asked her you know why do you write in Yiddish you know what's because that's the big question you know why these writers would write in Yiddish and she was like but that's my language you know if it's your first language that's what you're most I, that's my viewpoint. That's the language you would be most creative in. 
would you agree? Would you, as a, as a Russian um, transplant, would you feel like you're more creative yeah. in Russia? Of, of course, of course. And you draw from a bigger well, I guess. Yeah, yeah exactly. As a writer, I think that is something that you cannot express in English, even if you know English very well. It's very interesting how language is there because a lot of Russian people now use English word, even speaking Russian, and, and sometimes I see that sometimes this English word can express what I want to say much faster, mm -hmm. but in Russian I have to say that whole sentence, <laughs> in English it's just one word. So yes. it's really language, it's intellect, each language is specific, okay. but still, of course, I think in Russian, mm -hmm. and I would write in Russian. And I remember the rabbi who was here the first, mm -hmm. yes, and he was talking about Yiddish, and it's really sounds so colorful. I don't know English, I just know few words from my grandparents. Right, right. Yeah, but it's really colorful. Yes. And Yiddish is also so different wherever you go because it's kind of a mishmash and it evolves, you know, if you're from, you know, if you're um, Ashkenazi Jew or if you're a Sephardic Jew or you're over here in Africa or whatever, Yiddish changes according to who contributes to it. And I think that's so beautiful because it ties that people group together, no matter mm -hmm. where they are. Like obviously, there's other things that tie them together too. But like an outward expression of unity, mm -hmm. of like, hey, we have this language, and it might be different in different parts of the world, but we are standing together. Yeah, in this one language, outwardly but inwardly, faith is the same. And yeah, I, don't know, I just think it's so cool, especially in a world that's so divided. Right exactly, and. Um, I think Aaron Lansky, in his book, which you have Google, um, he talked about, he just, he started it in the 70s or 80s, collecting Yiddish books, because he, he figured, you know, he put out this plea, no social media, no email. So he's like writing, you know, temples or community centers or communities that he knew had large Jewish populations. and. The things that started getting, I think he said at one point he considered maybe 200, 300,000 volumes to be a large collection and that would be nice. And at, and at that point he started getting like two or three million items because people were finding things that other grandparents were passing away. So they found all these things in Yiddish, they can't read them, so they send them. And um, the center talked about the liveliness of the Yiddish culture too. They, they had theater, they had songs, they had plays, they had everything, mm -hmm. and all of it, you know, written in Yiddish. It's just fascinating. There's a and translators for each of these. I've always been fascinated by people who do translating translation because you always want to stay true to the voice of the author. And I do wonder, you know, how much, um, how you feel about writing in someone else's voice. Because you are, you're, you're rewriting it, you know. Yeah. You're really rewriting. It's a lot of you in these always. Yeah. So how much of your flavor, how much flavor does Ellen give to these stories? I feel um, such a kinship with with uh, Yenta that I feel that the, the you know the translation is really good you know mm -hmm. and she talks about some of the experiences of translating other people's works was was she selected to translate after Yenta died I think she only spoke with Yenta's daughter okay so I think so okay but Yenta didn't die till two thousand and um, 13. So, um, oh, I was I was telling you about you know she she got involved with this these writers in Israel and started writing and the daughters like Martin writing Yiddish and she explained that but um, 
I think she started writing these short stories to kind of tell these stories that were backed up. And she's always been a storyteller. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I find that with a lot of people that are really good writers, they're also just amazing verbal storytellers. Mm -hmm. I wonder too, and this might be, you know, we're talking about translators putting in their own flavors. As readers, we kind of put our own oh, yeah. spin on yeah. stories too. And I'm a therapist, and I wonder with these stories and her writing them later in her life, if some of it was just therapy for her and her way of dealing with the trauma, because there is a lot of trauma. Um, and these stories. <laughs> this is not light reading by any stretch. No, um, no. There's humor. There's like humor there is in life. You know, even when there are horrible things happening, there are periods of humor too. But I, I did wonder if this, in some ways, had been like just her therapy and dealing with her grief and her mm -hmm. trauma of what she had been through, because um, she herself was sent to Siberia and to Rose and, and had gone through that. So. No, no, I, I, I identify with that too. And um, I also like how um, Ellen Cassidy talks about this about, okay, so she was raised in Moldovia or whatever. But I can't get that word right. But, uh, and then, since, uh, so she has one language, maybe two with Yiddish. And yeah, of course, in your people know languages a lot better than we do. And she gets sent to Siberia, where, of course, she has to learn Russian. Maybe she already knew Russian. Then she settles in Israel. And I don't know if you know, you know this, but um, Israel was a new state when you know, she, she was going about this. And um, they elected to have Hebrew as a spoken and written language. Mm -hmm. Now, that was always the, you know, the men learned Hebrew, I think, you know, because of the, the that was what everything was written in for the men. Women, not so much. So she settles, and this is supposed to be her homeland, quote unquote, and she can't speak the language. She had to learn Hebrew. She didn't know it enough to converse it in day to day. So even in this place that she settles at, she she feels still feels like an exile. Mm -hmm. So that was just, you know, going from place to place to place. And um, I suppose every time she formed some form of family, whether it be friends or whatever, she had to kind of learn new ways and learn ways of being. It's just amazing. And of course, refugees do that all the time, right? You know, mm -hmm. they, they, they might have I've read about refugees, you know, in um, some of the Middle Eastern countries that are more peaceful will take refugees and they will stay in these camps for years. Their kids will learn that language. And then they're waiting for a ticket to possibly go to Australia or wherever. But in the case of the film that I watched, it was Australia. So then they would go to Australia, which is supposed to be their new home, but they've got to learn English. So what is that? How many languages is that that they that have to pass through to get somewhere? Just amazing at the capacity of humans mm -hmm. to adapt. Just the resilience that mm -hmm. humans innately have. Like I think when people this is my own view, but like when people are faced with a challenge, it can be like so overwhelming. But then once you get past it, it's like, oh. Like, okay, there's maybe some trauma from this in particular, but like, I did, I got through that, and I got to the next season of my life, and I learned from it, and I was able to like, I mean, she's able to share her stories, and yeah, we're learning from them now, so it's like, it's not, it's not all terrible. But she talked about those that, that weren't adapting. Yeah. Um, Mother Gerber, or whatever, the, the old woman who decided on the journey to Siberia, no, I'm not going to make it. So she lays down, and her two grown daughters are like, you know, um, there were people probably who just decided, no, I can't take it. Mm -hmm. And their own, maybe they even survived all of this, but they're so insure mm -hmm. in how they, you know, became 
afterwards. I, I, it would be hard to enjoy life if you didn't adapt a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. And I think a large part of their survival is their um, that tie of, of Judaism and, and the, the tie with other people. I mean, I think even at that point where there's, I think it's a mother, a mother and a daughter, and they're like looking, like, where are the Jewish people? We want to get close to the Jewish people. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, realizing that, okay, these are going to be the people with whom we are going because we're going to join their group. Mm -hmm. um, I do, as not, as a personally not a very religious person, I thought it was a beautiful tribute to how religion can really, I mean, just help people survive, not just individually, but collectively. Mm -hmm. I mean, and who better to demonstrate that than the Jewish people? I mean, really. Exactly. And and what did you tell your grandkids the days we had survived? You know, thousands of years, thousands of years, years, thousands of years of persecution. But they had little explanation from Jewish person, so we would know the sort of you, you know about anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. You don't know what it's really like, right? And what unites Soviet Jews is not even religious. Mm -hmm. It just being Jews, you outcast. Mm -hmm. You know, I know when I was growing up, it was you know seventies, but any anybody in the street can point at me and say, "Oh, you Jew," mm -hmm. you know. Oh, like my husband wasn't accepted. He was a gold medal. He won mass tournaments everywhere in Soviet Union. They failed him when he applied to university in Moscow. He got it in Ukraine where he's from, but in Moscow they failed him. Mm -hmm. So. The feeling that a lot of Jewish people get together because it's a common suffering. So it's uh, not, not even religious. I never was religious. And my husband here now, he becomes more because but it's it's strange things. You know, when here somebody asks, Who are you? And it's when Jewish people think Jewish religion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like it's nationality. I don't know, we call it identity. That was written in Soviet passport. Every Soviet citizen has his nationality. Ukrainian, Jewish, Tatar, whatever. Mm -hmm. And it was very important. We call it five happy food, five points. Mm -hmm. It was fifth in the passport of the when you were born in France, and then fifth was your nationality. Mm -hmm. And everything. If they look at your passport, see you Jewish, so many places are closed for you. You could I don't them. understand because wasn't the philosophy of how the Soviet Union okay. established was no religion, no we were you know, we're doing away with that. It's so life. It's so big life. It was mm -hmm. big words. None of those words. They were talking about everything belonged to people, everything belonged to this little group. <laughs> in the room, yeah, rural. Nothing belonged to people, yeah. No equality, nothing. It's all, that's why, you know, people say, oh, socialism is very bad, put in like Russia. Russia never had socialism. Mm. Never. Mm. Russia was called socialistic and we're building communism. It's mm -hmm. never socialism. It's mm -hmm. never. It has some elements like free education, free medicine. Right. They have parts, but the most holy common with all this, it's all I so saw. It was never quality. Tiger people, they only, everybody look at them for the low class. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They do clean streets. I think they that's do, human nature. Yeah. All that Jews, Jews, they smart, but they all filthy. Yeah, it's all like it's completely Nazi's philosophy. Yeah, yeah. completely. Yeah. So it, it's there's no. Yeah. I I know when like, my friends, Russian friends, it's cool who tell me, mm, I know you Jewish, but you know I still respect you. It's wow. How is this? You don't know who this person. Well, having your mother come from Cuba, mm -hmm. was do you feel like? Cuba's experiment with socialism was any 
different, or can you speak to that at all? It sounds very similar to what Rita is describing with Russia. I think there um, was a promise and, and an ideology that um, could be said is a beautiful ideology, right, of, of equality. Um, but I think in practice, what ended up happening, and, and granted, my mom's perspective is as an exile who had to leave mm -hmm. because of her anti-government activities. So, right. I mean, that's my perspective too, right. kind of, you know, through her. Um, but it's kind of the same thing. There's like a small group of people who are okay and who to this day have access to the internet. Meanwhile, the rest of the island, you know, struggles to feed themselves, people you know, throw themselves to the ocean on any and they're they and they're so quaint for having these like old cars and old buildings yeah. and things. Oh. Hello, Mira. Can you hear us? Gonna, let's see if I can get this screen to come up. Um, and it's quaint because they can't get new vehicles and things like that. So. Right. Yeah. Right. See if we could get this screen share. Let's see. And so good, uh, but I can only talk to you on the phone apparently. Hello, hello. Turn it down. Here. Take a look at my computer. It doesn't take the streamline. It doesn't take the streamline. My phone does. I will have to oh. talk to you on my phone. That's fine. We understand. We've got four people here, and we've been discussing a little bit, and would love to hear your perspective of Jens's writing. Um, as you have, have probably read this book more than once. Yes, I did, and I've taught it. I, I, I... Uh oh. Oh, goodness. This book, which I know she taught in day schools, and she also taught Schreiber, at, um, and Schreibman, and all of them are all my dear, dear to me. Like you said, I've read it more than once, and I go to sleep with them. They were on my right side of the bed and the left side of the bed. So these are, and Yente is like in the middle because she's the female writer in a world of male dominated. Uh, literature so I, I i'd love to talk to your patrons uh i don't know the age grouping i'm 81 and i've taught for 52 years my name is mira which uh, really means peace in russian like the mir shuttle yes yes so when you say mir in russian you mean peace like paz in in latin so you can understand that my bube coming back to just about 20 years before Yente in the 1880s. Uh, her name was Shalom or Shlomit, and she went to a Russian high school, and she was on the border of Poland and Russia, but she couldn't be called Shalom in the class. So what did they name her? Not Shalom in Hebrew, but Mira in Russian. So I'm, I'm the Mira, yeah. Well, tell us about your experience um, teaching this book. Well, what's important to me is, of course, to take you for a ride. I believe in art is life. <coughs> I believe life is art. And what Yenta did is really break, break the mold because the, in the 19th century artists were so different from where the specific and the humble and the balanced and simple, simple metaphors that she presents that in a way she shook the world and they accepted it as revisionism of history, revisionism of writing. Nobody wrote like that. The men all around her, Berliners and in Poland and especially in Lvov and Kishinev, they, they wrote universal stories to shake you and I up. She didn't come to do that. She came to take the individual woman, whether it's Gela or Yanta, or in Israel, or later, of course, in Haifa, and she gave them that simplicity of integrity, which made art and life different. You follow me? Yes, yes, I, I agree with that so much. 
So and I explained that, that she was writing about normal people, normal women. Now that's very important because I want to take you away. <clears throat> I mean, I want to show you if you can see pictures. I have so many notes. Look at my table. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like my house. Look at my table. That's my game table yet, yeah, my chess table. <clears throat> so here it is. We are taking you to Moldova. Yes. And that's yes. that little, little tiny between right there, Romania. Okay. And you see going west. Now, who are the writers in 1920 that she has to cope with? Russians, powerful Berliners powerful musicians, powerful opera. Do you know what a world that is of male dominated, powerful baton? Yes. So she, she picks up the pen and she writes about her little Zugitze Stettel. Yes. And when you go there today, my husband and I run the March of Living and we go to different little towns like Tukachin and, and of course Krakow and here is Kishinev. Very normal, very normal. Trees, yeah. black forest, black forest especially. So when we're coming to the tundra and we're coming to that forest where mother died, I mean, you have to get the art of life. Yes. You have to feel the snow. You have to feel the loneliness. Let's see if I can make a picture bigger. Mm -hmm. The ice. And Yenta, of course, surrounded by women. Can you see the pictures okay? I am going to see. Okay, wait a minute. No. no. Can you see the pictures? Yeah, there's small, but we can see them. Right. Yes. But to me, to me, you are most important because her family are these men. Here is Schreibmann. Here is handsome Schreibmann. And his name means Schreib, right? Mann, author. He changed his name from some Polish last name like Milachowski to Schreibmann the German word for author. Jonathan Safran Ford did the same thing. His middle name means Sefer, author. A lot of people do that. When they spend a life in art, an art of life, they change their last name. Like you have uh, Netanyahu. Netanyahu is not a family name. Milachowski was, but he was such a pr prominent, great scholar that he gave his name, Natan, given. Ya means God, God given. Netanyahu. Interesting. And here we are. This is her brother in law, Schreibmann. Great man, great, great man of poetry. And to make a living, of course, this is the writing. It's all about writing. And then we come to the editor of the paper, handsome. Slanted hat fedora. Look at that face. Uh, <laughs> yes. Look at that face. That face says, I have something to tell you. Abraham Sutzkever, 1913, 2010. They all lived a nice, long, 80, 90 year life. But you, Shana, and your people around you. Hello, everybody. I wish I knew your name. I wish I could touch you. I wish I could hear your voice because I have to apologize for my accent. My accent belongs to the Bronx. I came to the Bronx. I came to the Bronx at 15 and the British mandate in Israel, I was born in 42. The British mandate taught me British. So I came to the Bronx High School of Science saying half, bath, rather, dada. And the English teacher immediately said, well, Mira, you have to change your diction. And I asked, what's wrong with my diction? She said, we don't talk like that in the Bronx. <laughs> a year later, 
she said, you have to edit the yearbook because you're the only one who speaks in present and past participles. The rest of the kids don't know what a participle is. I said, well, how can you say anything without, I have done that, I have gone there. Well, did you get it? Did you go? Did you get it? No, 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 you got it. Did you get it? Yeah, you got it. Yeah, I got it. I got it. Did you go? Yeah, did you get it? Yes, you got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's, you know, that's Woody Allen, but it's true. It's true. It's true. Do you get it? Yeah, you got it. Yeah, yeah. Well, you are to me exactly what Yente was. She was the editor for 20 some years of the Golden Age Kate. The Golden Age Kate. Yes. That means, you see it? Mm -hmm. The golden kite is the chain of pearls. A kite is a chain and golden is gold. So when I come to teach and I come to you and you read the stories, I want to ask each of you, you are my golden kite. You are a story. You are a book. You relate to the bread. Do you relate to the raft and the van and on the van? on the whole story is a motion of movement. Movement from what? In the art world, are you moving from the particular to the universal? Are you moving from a universal idea of pain and hunger and slavery to a particular idea of resilience and faith and hope and other women and a yeah. table? So. You and I have a job to do tonight in our merely, we don't have the semester, but we'll squeeze it to 36 Jewish minutes. And then I ask each and every one of you, you are the golden arcade. It's not my lecture. What am I going to tell you? The Soviet Republic history? Yes, Yente belongs to that. Remember, 4,000 engineers leave Ohio in 1932 and 1936 to the paradise of the working men. Where is the paradise of the working men? Russia. Yeah, it never happened. <laughs> yes, yes. We are standing on the bread lines in the United States. We are going through a depression. And Russia is going through an explosion, total explosion of industrial complex. And they need engineers. And people from Ohio and people from Union Cooper, Cooper Union, they get on a boat and they go to the paradise of the proletariat. And that's right there between Minsk and the tundra and Siberia. So to, to give you a lecture on how the world changed with Stalin, to give you a lecture on privatization, how they lost their farms, to give you a lecture in 36 and 39 when, when it all closed down and the Iron Curtain came down and all these engineers wanted to go home in 48 and Stalin said, you're mine? Yeah. That's... Yeah. The, that's that's the reality of the time. You don't need my lecture for that. Yenta's book is so precious because the individual, the individual and you, me, the reader, become the story. How does it resonate with you? What is your favorite story? Bread? Okay. So we open up to bread. That's, us. that's what it is. Okay, lady number one. No, that's not you, Shannon. Lady number one, we go by suggestion and age. Who is the oldest? You go first. What's uh, your <laughs> What's your favorite I'm story? I'm assuming maybe the oldest. I don't know. Yeah, I'm the oldest too. Rita uh, immigrated to the United States from Russia, from Moscow. Wow, wow. Now she is <laughs> what they call she's hoy You know, when she when when she looks at Haifa on the eighth floor. Why is she on the eighth floor? What's so important not to be on the second or third? Why should you be on the eighth floor? I'm asking you. Moscow is hoi chafet still. That's way up high. Elite. Absolutely. That's the elite. Now, how do you relate to the Tundra and the Tiger stories and the River Ag? Tell me, as a Muscovite, a Muscovite with wide streets, how do you relate to that? To the stories? Yeah. I, are you asking about one particular story? Red? Whatever she wants to relate to. Because oh. all the stories, the whole the whole feeling. I was talking about uh we talked about bread, 
was Korea. And I was thinking that it's really kind of, for me, it's my past. It's my grandparents were, would not allow you to throw away little crumb of bread because it was life. Bread was life for Russian people, for Jewish people, for Soviet people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so this story really kind of bring back all those memories because in this rich country, we used to drink bread like something, you know, mm -hmm. every day, not necessity, but you know, but where from my childhood, I remember this is life. Bread is life. Yeah. So, and there was the story about yeah. the uh, bakery either collapsed, and so they had no bread, and they had no bread, they had no bread. Then they were promised all this meal, and it came at the perfect time for the matzah. Mm -hmm. And then it yeah, came right with matzah. Mm -hmm. If you have the book to page 26 and 27, look at the depth of the writing. 1943, just a date. A place, a table. Persona, the mother. The mother. When David Mammoth wrote his play, he looked at his grandmother and he didn't write her, he wrote her knife. She had a chop knife that did deliver the bread, the chop meat, the herring, the knife was the magic. That's the name of his Passover book. David Mammoth was inspired by one object. Yente tells us 1943 is not my inspiration here. If you don't understand 43, I can't explain it. There are no words, only volumes and volumes and volumes. But look at page 27. It's mother. No one moves until all the bread is on the table and mother is in charge. That's a Vermeer painting. That's a work of art. Mm -hmm. Yes. Smaller than anyone else, the tiniest piece becomes the light. The illuminated moral story here is not the plot, but the one crumb that matches the mother's glory. It's the light of the table, the little crumb. So from page 27, three lines, she will tell you as a writer, no one mentions it. You hear the silence? Mm -hmm. Yes. That is the sound of silence. That's the music here. The, the adagio of this bread is the light from the crumb, and of course comes the morale. The moral in the story is most important, not the plot. Let's not be the tyranny of plot. What, what happened? What happened? What? That's not so not important here. And that's the difference between the male authority of writing victory and the woman's authority to write the victor, the one who is in charge of that crumb. From earthen bowls and wooden spoons, do you feel it? The texture? Yes. Dance before your eyes. You hear the opera? Beautiful. Dance before your eyes. Now, the next movement from the book is for us to realize what does he do to the women around the table? Why is Yente so precious? What do they do with that bread? How do they use it? She, she has a theme of using the bread in many, many of her stories. Um, she talks about the mother that walks into the woods and disappears and the daughter is crying for her mother and finds the piece of bread under her mother's pillow. That one fascinated me. Morality. You hear the morality here? Yeah. You hear the shame? You hear the guilt? How could I do that? How could I do that? Steal it under How could I do that? It's not mine. Morality is what art is all about. There's no sense writing Russian or Jewish or Yiddish without being in charge of right 
and wrong, good and evil. This is not Dostoevsky. We don't need that. We don't need crime and punishment. The individual here is what sets right from wrong. Agreed. So she always, like an Yiddishist, asks the question at the end of the story. A question with a question. Why, I ask, why do we even bother to bless them? Why can't we start a meal, an Yiddish-speaking Jew, and say, eat? We can't. We have to give it to a higher authority. And what does it do? That's the question. You and I are not the reader. What does it do to us? Well, a lot of religions do that. The, uh, right. Yeah. right. That's the Eucharist. That's the whole idea of the Eucharist. That's the whole idea of the tiny little crack and the tiny little bread and it, and it touches us. And what does it do to us? It transforms us. That's the idea. If the reader is not transformed in those three pages, then Yente will give you the next story. She's not done with you. She's not done with you. No, no. She's... Agreed. She's not done with you. No, this is not the crescendo yet. No, no. But, but what we do, what we do now have is a new vocabulary for the literature. We have a vocabulary of balance, universal, and the particular. You have a language of moral wrong, from right and wrong. And we also have the next one. How did these women show resilience? Gosh, that was the highlight of each story, was seeing how they were going to transform their day or their next moment, uh, whether it was communing with new friends in the settlement or their family that remained. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So if you take the golden cake and if you take the silver thread and you run through the stories, you don't need the plot. You just have to find the gem, find the line, find the picture, find the art. That's immortal. Find the art. When you're on page 39, and little Schmendrick Galia goes from house to house, how does she barter for bread or potato? What is her talent? Not a farmer. Right. Not a Period, nothing at all. She has only one quality, and that's universal in Jewish survival from Babylonia all the way to Berlin. What does she know how to do to save her life and her family? She tells stories and writes them. Yeah. She knows how to write when nobody else does. She's five years old, seven years old, nine years old. A schmendrick, a galia. A galia means just a little wave, just a little wrinkle. She's nothing. She's a little, again, a hallowed crumb on the tundra. But when she comes to a house that needs a soldier's letter, it's World War I and still fighting in 28 and still fighting in, on the front line. How does she save her family? Fascinating. She what, mother, what mother will be most delighted with the daughter? Who can write letters? Galia wrote for the peasants to send to their sons at the front. It was thanks to these letters that the old couple invited her to sleep over and gave her a bowl of borscht. Now that's a little alliteration, right? A little bowl of borscht. You could have given her a bowl of potatoes, but that wouldn't sound so good in this adagio. We have to create art, music, pictures. 
Yes. How does that story resonate with you? And she didn't just do this for other Jewish families. She was doing the writing for everyone, no matter who they were. The universal is the whole point of the individual gift. Mm -hmm. That was the dream of the Soviet Republic. One for all and all for one. And even a little kid had a purpose. Even a little kid, she wasn't called Jewish. She didn't write for Jews. A letter is a letter. A pen is a precious sword. This little girl has a sword. She doesn't need any ammunition. She fights a whole war to save her family. She's a soldier on a, diff on a different front. Reputation grew. People would like save their candles and save their kerosene for times when she showed up and could write letters for them or tell stories for them. That, that was a wonderful currency. Yeah, on page 39 on the bottom, she's so powerful, she's so powerful that Yente can go against the Jewish establishment of the great Hasidic stories around her and the great Hasidic, the great yeshivas and as a one soldier with one pen, on the bottom of page 39, this little girl can bless, actually bless and use the words of Babis and change the liturgy. This is how Yente does revisionism. A woman is writing. There's no man around. The little girl knows the prayer. It's called Gutfin Avraham. Abraham, our father, or in Ladino, Padre, Avram, she opens up the gates of heaven with her words. I didn't yeah. touch on that before, but yeah, that, that is another um, theme of the book is that so much of culture and tradition was dictated by the men, was read by the men, but in this situation, only the women were there. So when someone died, they had to come up with their own forms of doing the uh, necessary rites and rituals. That's right. And you know, the one that is most, most is not just the one from Shabbos, but what about the Seder? When you got a whole text, Yes. A whole text, which is read by Rabbi Elizabeth, Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Dada. Oh, wonderful. Yente says, Hold it. Hold it. still. No man around because you don't know the text. There are four women sitting there. One is the wise one. One is the simple one. One asks the question. There you are, all four of you. Which role will you take? Yes. Which text will you read? Which story will you tell? That's the whole important point. So now our symphony has gotten to about the refrain. We got the hope, we got the resilience, we got the role of women, and she gets very, very intellectual only on page 100 and 38 the spine of the book smack in the middle comes now the orchestra the baton all the instruments together he gave an example we had a relative here in the city a pharmacist and they all believed that there's a reason in the world that rotates around his axis and they considered themselves too good to associate with anyone but the good people. Look at that statement. Good to associate with anyone else. The pharmacist always has his name inscribed in big letters in honor of wisdom. There's the simple wisdom. This is what Tiente is saying to all these aristocrats and all these intellectuals. And you know what? She reads German, 
and she read a lot of Thomas Mann, and she read Goethe, and she read the love poems, and she's saying to all of them, you have your ideas about universal right and wrong? Here we are. Here we are. Listen to our voice. That's suffragette. You don't have to go to Austria for that. You don't have to fight from London. You fight with Yente. Yente's stories shook the women, but it also made an impression on Kutzkever. It made an impression on Schreibmann, her brother-in-law. They sat with her. They listened to her. And she even gave them due. She said, okay, I respect you guys. There's a tree that stands alone. He's bent over. All the birds that to come, they don't come anymore. What is that tree? I, I don't know. The tree is the wedding tree, the bridegroom. The bridegroom tree, bride yes. Tree. Yes, yes, yes. The tree stands between heaven and rooted in the earth. And why does the bride and groom need the tree? They need the sky. They stand in the earth. They can do a chuppah. Why do they need a tree? I love that story, though. I, I, yeah, I, oh, you got it, Shannon. That is a piece of work. Beautiful. It should be read aloud. Resonate with the book. Take it to bed. Look at the limbs. It's uh, We have the giving tree in our literature, which reminds me of that, which we have Shelley, and we have, you know, a great deal about the tree. But here the tree is a concept. It's an intellectual metaphor. It gives food, but it also has to die in order to set its roots deeper. Mm -hmm. so when a wedding comes, when the bride and the groom and the town come to the tree, what are they saying? Well, they all yeah. knew that this was the meeting place for all community. And, you know, the bride's family, the groom's family, and it also became the meeting place of where disaster happened, where they met up with, you know, with their soldiers and uh, all the communities were brought to that tree when they were sent away. And I thought it was amazing that a Measure Schmidt bomb hit it and split the tree in two. Yep. I wonder, I, I don't know, was, was that based on truth in her, in her life? Well, of course, because you see, remember, she is battling ideas. She's battling lofty, intellectual, enlightenment ideas that are trying to somehow teach the morality, the essence of goodness from the human being to the universe not from the universe to the human being. It takes away governments. It takes away all the all the tyranny. It takes away all the czars. It takes away everyone that told you. Because if you don't have respect for nature, if you don't have respect for that which you have been responsible for, then you're cut in two and you cannot function. Message me, do you hear it? You hear it? Yes. It puts the whole history right there in his hands. He's got the tool, and he's got the ideology, and he destroys. Yente does that with one paragraph. It's amazing. The national order and the harmony of the universe, its very existence, is in our hands. Yes. We ended up that very well in our hands. Do you, do you uh, can you speak to anything about the translator, Ellen Cassidy? I don't think anybody's seen the video except me, but we were talking about translating works from the Yiddish. 
That's my question to you, actually. Is there anything in your writing? Because the Yiddish, as the Rabbi Soloveitchik said, don't look Yiddish as secular, look at Yiddish as a language of faith. It's a portable home for tradition. It's a portable home for 10 million people who have no flag, who have no land. And of course, they come off with their expressions of wisdom and sagacity from life, from everyday life. And the most important part is the music of life. So Yiddish is everything is poetically almost like breaking your teeth, but it's kinderish, you know, it's, it's, it's childish. It ends in a kind of a musical note that's a hard thing. So I'm asking you, how does the reading with all the insertions of the Russian Jews or the Russian or the Polish, or can you say yuck? <laughs> <laughs> can you just walk around and say yuck? <laughs> no. Or maybe you should walk around and say fe. <laughs> <laughs> what does it mean? It doesn't mean anything unless you look at, at the narrator's face, unless you look at the creator's eyes, unless you see who is doing it. Ellen belonged to a group of translators. When she came to Lenski's, uh, I was there 40 years ago with, uh, now she's a rabbi Kleinbaum, of course, and all of us from Colombia in the 80s, the Association of Jewish Studies, and we said, and we said, yes, and, and Ethan, you know, Ethan, who wrote how America was changed by Edith and Edith changed America, we realized that the movies and Broadway and Second Avenue Theater entertained about 4,000 words in Yiddish that entered the language. Not just the, oh, Galimt and the Chutzpah and the Gansa Megillah and it's kosher, all, all that. Does it add, I'm asking your gate, your golden Aketa Lachmain? I wish I was there. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I get it, yes. Oh, how does it add, or in the reading of the book, how does it take away? Because I have read Allende when she splurges with Paul Neruda's Spanish poetry. I have read all of them, taught all of them. And I say to my students, do you want to learn three verses in Spanish? Fine, read Allende. Do you want to read good, good, suggested in Russian? Then go ahead, learn a few phrases in Russian. But that's not the point. The point is not really to get the language into my teeth. The point is the language into my ear. It's all a part of the liturgy, the music, the sentence. Does it add? I'm asking you. Tell me. Does it add or does it take away? Adds, in my opinion. The, the language that they use is so vibrant. I don't know what Kadilishka and Kandilikman means, page 141. I have no idea when and how to use it. How can I even think of taking a job where half the words I don't understand? My shandal, as you know, is no babe in the woods. You don't need to explain things twice. She's from Odessa. Right, my lady from Moscow? When you hear eight different languages around the table, nobody has to explain to you why. <laughs> why? Why don't they have to explain to you? No. Because it's a part of your meal. It's a part of your breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Yeah. It's a part of the air. It's a part of life. Nobody has to explain. And Yente is wonderful. She goes on and she says, the next day, when she came home from work, she was laughing so hard. I doubled over. Chin was shaking. It's just as I thought. All stuff and nonsense. <laughs> because that's what it comes down to. I don't need a Google for the word oy vey. 
Right, <laughs> right. You feel it, yes. you use it, you mean it, it's yours. It's a lot of fuss over nothing. A lot of fuss over nothing. <laughs> and you know, Shana, when Ellen spoke at the YouTube when you saw that presentation, yeah. the only question they had for her is what does this Yiddish word mean? Oh, yeah. yeah. You don't ask Ellen that. And you know what else? It doesn't matter. And Ellen doesn't know because that's not the essence of the Yiddish. Right. The essence of the Yiddish is the story and your eyes closed and your ears open and your heart pounding and touching, touching, touching the wooden balls, touching the clothes, touching the pen, touching. And they all go home feeling that everything is temporary, that nothing lasts forever, and that something very important has been lost. Isn't that beautiful? Beautiful, gorgeous. What is yeah. Yenta's message in this whole walking and tundra and a ride? There is always a shadow in danger. That's a historical novel when you don't have to explain, but the reader is demanded to feel what is the shadow of danger? A soldier in area C? Yes. A yes. uniform on the train track looking for the ride? The right. little wolf, red riding wolf, metaphor in the forest when she's all alone and she watches the body on the snow that yes. historical novel, Yente manages the history by taking us right through and letting us know, letting us know there is a value, there's a value here that is found in war and peace, crime and punishment, brothers, all of them, all of them, all of them. I don't have to impress you with 50 titles to tell you life and death. Now, is the feeling about dying throughout the book? That is probably our most important question. How do we face death? Interesting. That, that is something I struggle with. And we see our parents or loved ones pass, and, and you see different versions of how they face death. And you are the vehicle. Tonight is a sacred hour, not because we tell and retell and retell what Yenta said, but we have to thank Yenta and resonate. How do we accept life in its hope, in its resilience, in its difficulty, but more important, how do we accept it? Interesting. <laughs> This is not a Holocaust book. That's the point. The point is they're not dying because somebody's standing there with hatred. They're dying because life, wherever you find it, whether you're teaching slavery, whether you're teaching Tantra, whether you're teaching China, it, it's not the place. It's not the place that matters. What matters is the journey from life and how to die and how to live on them. That's the question. Yes. And she gives it to us in a very, very interesting way. How do you think she does that? She shows so many examples of the, like the grandmother who decides on the boat that she's not going to take, you know, going to live this through this journey. And yeah. She just lays down and, you know, doesn't want to go on. And the daughters see this and they don't know how to deal with it. Yeah. You see, European literature, especially the Russian literature, is so familiar with the struggle of life that dying is like living on in somebody's memory. 
the memory part becomes very important. Nowhere else in the world are there more monuments and more statues and more scriptures and more writing, especially in the Muslim world, with all the Quran in Morocco, with all the Quran in Spain, wherever you go in Timbuktu, wherever you go in the writing on the walls and the stories that are told, life goes on. Yes. It's not the teardrop of death. It's how do we learn to live as well as learn to accept death. And here, Yenta gives us a present. You know how she does that? It's called One More Time Around. <laughs> She's so clever. She's so clever. In Haifa, the proletariat of Israel, She's not on the top of Jerusalem's holy temple. No, 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 no. I don't need that. No, no, I don't need that. She's not on the depth of any holy Jordan River. No, no, I don't need that. No. I have a holy spot. And where is the holy and the sacred? Where all those schmatis gets regurgitated in the market. When all those old clothes taken out by people who died five minutes ago. <laughs> what happens to them? You I gotta read the end of the book, it's amazing. She's in a marketplace in Haifa. She goes from stall to stall and she comes to the final grinder, grand grinder. And it's got the dumpster of this wonderful couple that came from Germany and traveled to Europe and went to the opera with gloves and wonderful, wonderful pearls and all, all the stuff they gathered, the tchotchkes and tchotchkes and tchotchkes that are in the dumpsters. And guess what? The dumpster grinds it all up, <laughs> spits it all out. And there's a million and little reminders all around. I, I mean, to teach a story like that, you ask your students who are 20, you don't have to get it. You don't have to get it. But when your great grandma says, what shall I do with my stuff? Don't tell her it's going to go in the dumpster. No. <laughs> no. Don't tell her that the, that the, that the, 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 the yes, you can say the veterans are coming to pick up your, your, your clothes, the Monday morning baggage, yeah. And you, the tchotchkes are going to go on display in a beautiful thrift shop. You tell her where the stuff is going to be displayed in the most wonderful marketplace in the world. Your right. church is not going to get lost. They're not, don't talk about the dumpster. <laughs> well, Mira, we're going on almost two hours. So, so what I is the story? The neighbor says, would you like a cup of tea? Is there another time around? And the love affair here for Yente is both. Remember, she's an immigrant. Who does she have to fall in love with? A new country. Yes. A new language. New schmatis. New tchotchkes. People that don't understand where she came from. And she can't explain. But she can love again. That comes from Cynthia Ozek's beautiful, beautiful book. Rosa is in Miami, a beautiful book, and Paretsky is in the laundry. Every day she comes to the laundry and says, Paretsky, what are you doing here? Women do the laundry. My gut kiss are going to the laundry. I don't want you to watch my gut kiss. Now, how am I going to tell you what gut kiss are? <laughs> do I have to explain? No. Don't no. Look at gut kiss, all right? And he says, I like waterfall. I like Niagara Falls. I love to watch the washing machine go round and around. And finally, he says to her, Rosa, I'm from Poland. You're from Poland. You're from Warsaw. I'm from Warsaw. Look how much we have in common. Cynthia Ozek in one line sets him straight. Your Warsaw is not mine. In 1942, Herr Moldova, Herr Kishinev, is not the Kishinev of the past. 
there was hope, there was enlightenment, there was a hope for the future. There was such turmoil in art and poetry and music and revisionist history and revisionist writing. Yenta broke the envelope to write more. She didn't have to run away to Israel, but she had to start. And sure enough, even her typewriter, even her typewriter, Erica. Erica typewriter, yes. Erica is now not a typewriter. Erica is Reb Aaron, Rabbi Aaron, gets a promotion from a typewriter to a teacher to immortality. <laughs> well, thank you, guys. Really, I thank you. I'm sorry we don't have enough time. I wanted to hear from you. I'm selfish. I wanted to learn, Shana. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Any questions is all yours. I know you go to dinner and I'm going to sleep. But tell me. <laughs> but I'm going to dream about you because you're like close to me, but you're so far. The literature makes us sisters to go to bed with something the same. You're holding the book. I'm holding the book. Well, here we are. Thank Only you miles so much. Distance. Here we are. <laughs> My lover, your lover, here we are. Yeah. Any Thank questions, you. dear? Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> we'll meet again. Take care, dear. We are doing Gleitstein in November, and Gleitstein is so beautiful. It's worth the read, Shana. The next two books, the Gladstein book and, and the uh, postscript. Beautiful by Chava Rosenbaum. So we'll meet again. Thank, thank you, thank you, you thank you, thank you. Shloofy, shloofy, shloofy.